You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors, All right, everybody. That music means it is Education Wednesday. It is time to gather here together one final time for the year of 2021 on the Options Bootcamp Drill Instructor Proving Ground. Don't you worry. Don't fret. We'll be back again in 2022, which sounds so futuristic. It doesn't sound like we're in the time of, of Buck Rogers and Star Trek at this point, but I digress. So, yes. Our final episode of the year. Hope you enjoyed our look back year in review. Top lessons learned from the year that was 2021. Last episode. If you have your own thoughts, what are some lessons you learned? Some maybe consequences, maybe some things you encountered you didn't expect. Maybe some interesting takeaways you had from the options market. I know for a lot of you, this was your first full year of options trading. Maybe not even a full year. Your first you know, significant portion of a year (laughs) trading options. Hit us up. Let us know. I'm curious what your takeaways were from this mad year that was 2020. Easy for me. I can't say the year is this year. (laughs) This mad year that was 2021. You know who else is curious about you folks, wants to see what you have up your sleeve? It is the black-hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring, a.k.a. what the cool kids call mm to Mr. P, how are things in the land of um to um these days? Hey, it is really good, Mark. Really great. You know what else is really great? It's some mail. So let's get to it. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, everybody, let us do it. Let us proceed to the mail call room one final time here for 2021. Let's also pay off some final questions of the week's last year here. Remember on our last show, listeners, last time we got your insight on a question of the week, it was this tumultuous question. Will VIX close above or below 20 to end the year? Not for the end of the week like we usually ask you just the end of the year which again is a lot of seasonality baked into that a lot of crazy things that can go into that prognostication and it seems like you folks were pretty evenly split once again it was somewhere around 52 53 percent saying just slightly below 20 and around 47 percent saying above 20 so once again we've asked you this question in various flavors a couple of times now and you guys are just split so evenly down the middle which is a fascinating And B is what makes an interesting market. So we shall all see as the year comes to a close where we're hanging out from an overall vol perspective. Right now, Dan, perhaps hitting a little bit closer to home, our question of the week is this. We talked about on our last episode just the the many impacts of the meme stock explosion, the tidal wave, call it what you will, on the world of options in 2021. We still don't really know all of them, quite frankly. I'm sure there will be books to come written about this, case studies in business schools for years to come. 
But it also, some people are starting to wonder, maybe as that tidal wave, is it kind of losing some of its momentum? that crashed in to start the year. Is it kind of going out with the whimper? So we thought we'd ask you guys. You know, we kicked off the year riding the meme stock wave, but has the interest in names like AMC and GameStops and your Rockets and your B-Bigs and everything else, has all that begun to cool? Quite simply, is the meme stock wave dead? Gave you three choices because we always like to throw a curveball in there for you. It's, it's no fun just to say yes or no. You got to have a fun third one in there. And so we gave you yes or no or C, I prefer crypto. Mr. Dan, what are your thoughts on this? You think the meme stock wave is dead or not? Or perhaps maybe you're a preferred crypto guy. I'm not going to put words in your mouth. And then B, more importantly, what do you think our audience is voting for? Uh, I, I feel like I can answer this one pretty definitively, Mark. Uh, no, it is not dead. Um, we, we've had a few hit options Raider, you know, this week. And, and, you know, the, like they just keep playing out. Um, I mean, Wish was pretty good yesterday. Um, we had uh, just a couple. I mean, we had a couple little minor ones today. Uh, Curie, C-U-R-I. Um, I mean, it wasn't a big short squeeze, but e- e- like even not with one of these big, huge, gigantic spikes, traders can still make money trading some of these things. So, yeah, no, definitely not dead. And I'm going to say that folks listening to our show know that. And I think that they also say, no, it is not dead. I had a feeling you might have an axe to grind on this one since you are busy raiding when I'm not talking to you day after day. So uh, you very much have some skin in the meme stock game. And Dan, you will be pleased to know that our audience agrees with you. 59%, sir, saying no, the meme stock wave is not dead. Does that surprise you, sir? It surprises me that it's that low. I would have thought like even more folks would, would you, say that. You wanted like 90%. 90% or yeah. nothing for Dan, listeners. So, Dan, you can get in there, add options, make your voice heard, and push that percentage up a little bit. Yes, 34.4%. And I prefer crypto coming in at a respectable 6.6%. What do you guys think? Get in there. If you're listening to this live, you can go vote right now. If you're listening to it shortly after it goes up on the network, which will be a little bit later today, then you still have about a day and change left to go make your book. But definitely by the end of the week, this question is done. It is our question of the week after all. So A, if you're not following us at options on Twitter and at options on stock twits and all the other major social media platforms, then you should be. We got at options for a reason after all, listeners. We are pretty good at this thing. And then B, you should uh, make your voices heard so other folks can see what you have to say. Let's go on out now to some of your cues. Let's go to his. This is a nice, fun basic perhaps deceptively so question here this comes from mjlt dan and he or perhaps she wants to know how do you decide when to use a spread versus an outright option you know this is a great question actually for a lot of our newer listeners who seem to be all about the outrights right now dan they haven't seen a 25 delta call in a tech name that they don't love and want to buy (laughs) <laughs> so uh, so what do we do with those folks how do we explain to them when to maybe think about a spread versus an outright sir uh, well <clears throat> you know like i the best way to think about it is like you know you should know that like options are centered around volatility like you can't have a conversation about options without talking about volatility and so a spread like literally spreads off some of the risk you're buying one option and selling one option so so you're kind of expecting less volatility when you do a spread. <clears throat> These things like some momentum pl- plays, like like Options Raider or our red knockout system that are momentum plays, um, you know, those a lot of the times we're just using straight calls. So red knockout can kind of go both ways to do some spreads there too. But um, yeah, I would say generally speaking, smaller moves for spreads. And if you're expecting a larger move, you tend to do an outright option. Yeah, that's kind of the basic rule of thumb. People think I I don't like outright options because I make fun of them a lot here on the show. But no, there is a definite use case for them. And it's what Dan just laid out. If you're expecting the S&P to fall out of bed tomorrow and keep falling out of bed for the next month, you buy a put option, you're doing pretty well. Obviously, you could short the future too, but then that comes with a whole bunch of other capital considerations or risks you may not want. You buy a put, your risk is limited to what you bought. Same deal. If you think XYZ name is going to be the next hot meme name, going to get squeezed to high heaven. It's going to go from 10 bucks to a thousand. You buy a $20 call. You're looking pretty darn good out there in that name. So yeah, if you're expecting these earth shattering moves 
a lot of vol, a lot of action, a lot of big movements. So yeah, you you definitely would be well served with an outright option. But yeah, smaller moves, more incremental moves. Maybe you only expect a particular range of movement, then a spread around that range, something along those lines makes a great deal of sense. So for the lion's share of the opportunities we're looking at here, a lot of them are very spread worthy. But for where Dan's looking for some of these big pops, you want to capture them. Yeah, the outright options are certainly a great way to go. Actually, good question there, NJLT. All right, let's go out to John. John Douglas says, not sure if you guys have addressed this already. If so, I apologize. But it seems like end-of-day options quotes tend to show some ridiculously wide bid-ass spreads. Uh, what's going on behind the scenes there? Why can't they just take the prints from right before the close and disseminate them? Well, you know, think about it there, John, and everybody else. Who, you know, you're looking at this. Now you're looking at a market that is effectively closed, right? So the underlying, well, the underlying could still be printing for a while. Stock prints after the options. But the options market is closed. So most market makers, just by default, are going to, to widen out at the end of the day. Why would you show a super tight market when the, the stock is going to be effectively closed and you don't know what's going to happen in the after hours? So you widen out, you show less displayed size, and you come in the next day and you reset and you try to live to fight another day. So yeah, when the underlying market is closed or effectively closed, there still is some printing in the after hours, but it's nowhere near as deep and as liquid. You're going to see the stock gap all over the place as well. So that's when you're going to see the options widen out. And also, yeah, they're not trading anymore. It's more really just for display. If you go in and you want to know really where things are printing, you can still take usually the midpoint of that bid-ask spread. It's going to be a wider spread, like you said, but the midpoint is going to still have some value for you if you're looking to try to intuit where these things should reasonably be trading right now. Mr. Dan, anything to add for John here wants to know, when, when things are closed at the end of the day, why are options spread so wide? Well, you know, there's a couple of things, <clears throat> um, you know, first, when it's really close to the end of the day, like the last minute or so, like, like, think about how long it takes you to execute a trade, like raise your hand if you ever like put in a trade and you said, what, how did I get filled? Oh, no, I meant to hit buy or no, I meant a hundred shares, not a thousand shares or, oh, I put in a limit order. I meant to do a stop. Like, you have to take your time in. You can't in, see me, but I'm raising my hand right now, sir. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like you, you have to, like, you need at least a good solid minute to enter a trade. And and what a lot of people don't think about is from the market maker perspective. Um, from the market maker perspective, like as soon as they make an option trade with you, they have to go and hedge the other side in the in the market. And if the market closes before that happens they're in trouble. They're, they're hung on deltas and, and they're not going to be able to hedge properly. They'd have to hedge it after hours where the market's illiquid. And if they've got to buy 10,000 shares, they're screwed. So they need to, they need to pad their, their profit a little bit to, to just to protect themselves. Um, and then the other thing is too, you know, in the last five minutes or whatever of the day, like there's this thing called um, market on close imbalances where like all of a sudden a big rush of orders goes through. And so like you can see, um, you know, like the underlying maybe be a little bit more volatile then. And that's scary too for market makers who are hedging. And so they have to widen their markets to protect themselves. So, you know, when you think about it from that perspective, like that's why. I'll never forget when I first walked into uh, the equities crowd from the SPX, I cut my teeth on the SIBO on the SPX. And that was a Entirely different story for another day about breaking into that monstrous pit back in the day. <laughs> but then going out into the days of multiple listing and then all the exchanges started adding all of the big options. So this was the, the latter days of the dot-com boom listeners. So they were adding all the big tech names. So SIBO added Intel and Microsoft and all these other hot names. So I went out and fought for a spot in Intel. I remember I went out there early on and there were some old timers in that pit who'd been around for a while. And I would see them towards the end of the day, Dan, the last five or 10 minutes, just fold up their sheets or turn off their handheld and, and just walk away and leave. And one day I pulled one of them aside, a couple of them aside. I was like, what are you guys doing? I mean, this is end of the day. This is where, this is where you want to be here. This is where the action comes in. And they all looked at me and said, yeah, no kid, you don't want to be here the last 10 minutes. That's when the pickoff paper comes in. And I was like, yeah, what are you talking about? Then surely enough, Dan, all of a sudden, yeah, I got my first, let's say a run over from pick your broker, Goldman, Merrill, didn't matter. <laughs> I got to buy 10,000 of these at 259. How are they? Oh, wait, sorry. You can't get your stock. Because the stock's closed, right? A few of those, and you'll kind of learn the lesson. So, yeah, that kind of gets back to what Dan was saying. 
Any fun memories along those lines, Dan, getting picked off at the end of the day? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, it, it happens. Yeah, because it's so random. <laughs> I, I remember this one time where, um, you know, like one thing that mark makers do is they like to just like, especially on expiration day, they like to close things they they, they got to close. Uh, I mean, especially if you're long or short, some, um, some like near the money options, like you don't want to get pinned. And there's this one time I was short, like, I don't know, 35 of these calls or whatever. And um, so we're, we're like right at the strike price and, and somebody else happened to be long them and he had to sell them. So I'm like, okay, you know, sold, I'll, I'll, I'll buy them from you. And as soon as I bought them, like the stock just rallied, like it was total coincidence. And the guy was so pissed. So off. he wanted He's to like, bust it. I'm sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, man. Uh, you know, I mean, first of all, I hedged immediately. So it's not like I, you know, <laughs> like had some big windfall or something. I, I probably got a little lucky and, and made a little bit on it, but. Yeah, like he was so pissed. Like he's like, "How did you know?" I'm like, "What do you mean? How did I know? I didn't know anything. I'm just trying to flatten out." Since we're talking about picking off other guys in the pit, really quickly, because this is somewhat related to what we're talking about. I learned that lesson as well, Dan. Maybe not to p- pick off guys like that, but also not to celebrate my victories. Because I remember one time, you know, you're always working your gamma scalps far away from where you're trading, and I had some pretty sizable gamma scalp in in uh, in Intel at the time. It was somewhere well below where the stock was trading. And also I looked down at my stock handheld and I'm filled on a ton of stock well below where the stock was. It was like, I don't know, maybe a point and change. That was a big move back then. And I remember saying, whoa, oh my God, I just bought whatever it was. I don't know, 29 and a half stock. I was so excited. I'm celebrating. And I hear from behind me, what? <laughs> I hear a bunch of swearing and I hear some guy go storming off. And it turns out it was some guy behind me who had entered in the wrong price and he sold it to me and so he promptly ended up trying to get it busted we had to adjust it and it was so i learned to keep my mouth shut on those dan which was <laughs> a good lesson to go but do it. yeah there's a lot of those kind of fun stories we could tell about the end of days and all the madness that goes on we'll have a story time one day dan what do you think on the show yeah yeah that sounds great for all these new kids who have been in the options market three months it may be a little eye-opening to hear <laughs> to hear how the sausage is made <laughs> all right yeah, yeah. let's go around the horn let's keep going let's go to rashad rashad's got a good question here he wants to know can you pretty much roll your positions endlessly or does your broker put a limit on it also is it best to roll to the same strike price just in a different month hmm that's an interesting interesting twofer there uh, the first part i i i can't foresee a broker saying, hey, you get six rolls. <laughs> the limit for your rolling is going to be the capital in your account, right, Rashad? So if you have the money in your account and you persist in rolling for whatever reason, if a position if a position has gone against you that many times that you have to keep rolling it, it's probably something you should think about. We talk about rolling on the show many times, and you don't really want to go really beyond one. That's usually the limit. I don't know many people who are serious options traders who will go beyond one, except maybe in some really aberrant scenarios. So if you roll once and it's still going against you, clearly something is wrong with your analysis or something else. Cut your losses, live to fight another day. But yeah, your broker's not going to say, hey, you rolled this six times and it hasn't worked, so you can't do the seventh. If you have the capital in your account to do it, they will let you keep doing it. So yeah, I've never heard of a broker saying six laurels, that's it. (laughs) That that would be weird. But hey, I, I guess we're living in weird times, so I guess nothing would surprise me. Uh, the latter part, is it best to roll to the same strike price just in a different month? Well, that, that's a bit of a, of a loaded and subjective question. If you're getting blown through, you sell puts and something, and you know the stock blows through your strike, but you're adamant in keeping that short position on, so you roll it, but you keep it in the same strike. You just go out a few months. You're really just keeping the same problem. You're just buying yourself more time. You haven't adjusted the position really at all. So I'm not a huge fan of keeping things same strike you probably want to get a little bit more more relevant strike if you are going to roll so roll down you know live to fight another day or in the case of a call strike if it let's say it blows through your covered call if you then roll it same strike but a couple months farther out you haven't really done much to buy yourself more time it's still through your strike you haven't changed that fundamental problem so uh, i'm much more of a fan of, of adjusting your strike that's kind of what you really need to fix usually more than just the time you want to add some time usually too but your strike is where the problem is. If you don't fix that, you're kind of missing the point. Uh, Dan, anything to add on rolling a limit from your broker and also the mechanics of rolling, keeping it the same strike or not? 
Yeah, I can assure you, your broker wants you to roll as much as humanly possible because that's more commissions for them. Uh, so yeah, don't worry your pretty little head about that, my friend. Uh, and as far as rolling to a different striker month, well, you know, I mean, that, that depends, that depends on what the stock has done. And, uh, it's important to get good at doing both of those things. Uh, and in fact, doing sometimes doing both at the same time, roll diagonally, um, because different, different scenarios are going to call for different versions of that. Um, I mean, if the underlying just doesn't move, uh, I mean, first of all, like what position are we talking about? Diag diagonals, time spreads, you know, just cash cured puts. I mean, I don't know for most of those, if the underlying just doesn't move at all and everything just works out perfectly, yeah, we're just rolling out to a different expiration. Um, but if the underlying changes, uh, you know, changes relative to the strike prices, we're probably changing the strike. And if we, and, and if the premium isn't what we want when we roll to the strike, we might have to roll out also to a different expiration. Um, you know, I'm talking kind of high level conceptual here, but without, real hands-on examples. That's the only way to do it. So hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, if you're winning, if you're selling covered calls and you're winning on the same strike every month, right? No reason to change strike <laughs> if the stock hasn't moved. But yeah, most of the time people get them into trouble in rolls when it goes against them, right? And so that's when they really need, that's usually when you're blowing through your strike and you need to make some changes. What do you think, Dan? I think I'm going to open up a new brokerage and it's going to be solely based around a six roll limit. What do you think? Think that's going to have some legs? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. When, when you are looking for investors, let me know because uh, I'm going to be busy that day. Longo House Brokerage, six <laughs> rolls max. Bam. I mean, we're going to charge full commissions back to the old days, like $40 ticket charge. We're going to bring that back too. It's going to be, it's no. going to be a winner across the board. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> good times for everyone. No, it's, we're having fun, Rashad, but that is a good question. A lot of people like to know the mechanics of how the market works out there. Let's go to J-Man. J-Man wants to know, how does it work when you sell a call against a long in-the-money call slash stock substitution position? Does the broker margin you like if you wrote a traditional covered call? After all, you aren't really covered in your short call position. Do they margin you like a naked short call? Is it is it up to you to have to close or roll it before you get to the strike? Well, you know, this question has come up a lot, especially recently. Some people are into stock substitution right now. Uh, I've talked to brokers about this specifically. We've had broker reps on the network, discuss it. Brian talks about this fig leaf all the time over there on his OPR and how Ally tends to treat it. We just had Steve Sosnick from IB on our pro QA not too long ago. We got a similar question along those lines, and he discussed it how IB works. It first off, it's all going to obviously depend on your account size, what type of account you have, what margin treatment you have in your account, or your portfolio margin. You're more the old school Reg T, so that's going to be your your first entry level there. Then pretty much after that. It's really much a depends situation. <laughs> depends on your brokers. Depends on where the strikes are lining up. If you put on, let's say, a stock substitution, you're buying something, let's say, I don't know, it's nice, close to 100 Delta call. It's, let's say, 50 handles in the money. And you're selling a call against it. That's, let's say, that call is six months or a year out. And then you have selling a call, like, let's say, in a weekly that is, let's say, pretty far out of the money as well. Doesn't have a good chance of really coming to fruition. Yeah, you're going to be margined pretty favorably in that scenario because the risk of that call coming due is really pretty low where this becomes a gray area for a trade is what happens when you start getting closer to that strike right and that's where a lot of brokers will start to get a little bit nervous and they will start treating that call obviously going to have a much higher probability of coming back to bite you so you're going to start seeing that margin benefit and that margin offset really start to go away so that's why what was the last party question is it up to you to close it and roll it before you get to the strike? Yeah, that's why I say with this type of position, call it whatever. Call it a synthetic covered call. Call it a fig leaf. Call it whatever the hell you want. This is not a set it and forget it trade because as you rightfully pointed out, you are not really covered. So when you get close to that short call strike, you're probably going to have to, going back to our old question, you might want to roll it or just close it out because you are not covered. And you don't, one thing you don't want to do is go out to that six-month or one-year call and have to exercise it to get shares to cover your – that's a disaster. Look at all the time premium you're giving up. You do not want to do that. So you have that there as kind of a worst-case scenario in case that comes to pass, but 
you don't really want to have to do that for all the reasons we've talked about many times here on the show. The exercising an option, you're just giving away all that time premium. If you go out that far, that's a substantial amount. So the answer to your question is kind of a maybe slash if. And you definitely have to babysit it and maybe take it off yourself or roll it when you get short or close to your short strikes. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no I wish there was a, a you know, one size fits all answer to this question. But unfortunately, there is not. Mr. Dan, anything to add? This is a popular strategy now, it seems like, just given the quantity of questions we're getting on it. But also, it's uh, kind of a bit of a gray area. Um, yeah, I mean, I never like to answer margin questions definitively because I can't, um, you're, I mean, but I call you Dan, the margin man, you're all my go-to margin questions. So do you, (laughs) right. Um, I mean, the fact is your broker can margin you with any position, however they want, as long as it's within OCC guidelines. Um, and you know, if they want to do really prohibitive margin, I mean, they can, and, and, and they can change their margin rules on you in a, in a split second decision. Uh, but the one thing that I can answer definitively is th- your last part that says, is it up to you to have to close a roll before you get to the strike? Yeah, man, it's your money. Nobody cares about your money as much as you and margin or assignment aside, like, I mean, it, like, is that what you want? You want uh, to have the stock go through the strike and you want to end up with a short stock position. I mean, far be it for me to say, you know, you shouldn't. I mean, if that is part of your plan, great, then let it happen. But if you don't want it to happen, then don't wait for somebody to come and tap you on the shoulder and remind you, like, you know, it's your money, man. Like, manage your positions. Um, that's the thing about option trading is it really requires, it really requires, like, being a disciplined manager you're a risk manager first that's what we say around here indubitably and if you guys want a, a deeper dive into this we obviously have done some stock substitution episodes here on, on boot camp go check out the feed for those but go to the options playbook radio the opr feed on our network and go look for all the episodes there brian has done a ton of these on he calls it the fig leaf strategy and he talks a lot about the real world consequences of this in terms of margin and everything else like that so if you want a deeper dive into this particular strategy opr is probably your best bet. All right, Dan, we're coming up against it here for the year. We've been gassing on about options for a while. Let's get out of here on this one from CJT. We're just talking about exercise and assignment and rolling and stuff. Let's go to this one here then. It's along the same lines. CJT says, I like to write covered calls, but they seem to be called away early sometimes. Interesting. I guess he's writing maybe on some on some hot tech names. <laughs> he says, when, th- when they are, it's usually at the peak in price before a drop happens. Am I nuts or is this a thing? (laughs) Should I be using this as a trading indicator to fade the stock in the other direction? Well, this is an interesting question. I have to say we haven't received this one before. Mr. Dan, what do you think? Is he nuts or is this a thing? Uh, Those are not necessarily mutually mutually exclusive. Yeah. Look at Um, Dan. I mean, exhibit one right there. Yeah. Um, But but you know what this kind of reminds me of? There is like a... A George Costanza bit on an old Seinfeld episode where like George was like, you know, I forget exactly how the bit went, but he's like, you know, every everything I do, I do wrong. So from now on, I'm going to do the opposite of what I think I should do. <laughs> like, that's kind of what this reminds me of. Like every time I write a covered call, I get assigned. And when I do, the stock goes down. So I'm just going to write covered calls and I'm going to short, you know, like, uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, assume any causality uh out of out of this but um uh, it's it's an interesting observation <laughs> yeah i have to say i have not seen this as being a thing here cj i have not seen a rash of early exercises on calls outside of maybe a few aberrant names uh, because as we said many times on this show as i just mentioned with the fig leaf question that early exercise is not going to get you a lot. It costs you money, except for a few very specific scenarios. So you don't see it happen too often. So trying to key off of early exercise on the call front. First off, you're going to see a lot of that around XDIV, and that's pretty much it. So is that the only time you want this indicator to work? I have to go on the limb and say, it's, it's, you're probably not nuts. <laughs> I don't know you, but you're probably not nuts. But I don't think this is a thing, CJT. And Dan, I lied. We got one more. This is the perfect question to actually... To close out our year on 
for the mad year that was 2021. Let's go out to Beverly. Beverly wants to know, what is the craziest trade you've seen in this meme stock 2.0 frenzy? Well, 2.0 frenzy. I guess that means, does she mean the latter half of the year then? I don't know, because I, I think if I look at the meme stock trend overall, to me, it's still it's still just mind-boggling the early days of the meme stock frenzy in GameStop. And we saw that initial push you know, into the 60s and then into 100 and then into 200 plus and 300. And we saw levels of implied vol, like I mentioned earlier on our last episode, you know, the 1000 percent implied vol level became a thing. And that's trust me, listen, that's not a thing. So it became a thing in GameStop for the first time. Then we saw that that wave ripple out throughout the rest of the options market over the course of of the year that was 2021 and it was replicated to smaller degrees usually in other names your amcs your b bigs and others but to me that initial explosion and foray and saying man this this there can't be more oh there is more to this oh yeah there is more upside oh yeah this they have to be done now oh no here we go again that initial just sequence to me is still one of the most fascinating things i've seen in all the time i've been trading options Again, I, there's going to be, there already have been many articles of things written on it, but there will be many case studies and books written on it in, in the days to come. And I don't think we've seen really the end of the regulatory ramifications of that as well. So it's that initial, st- we had just come off of this network, a fun kind of half joke poll, which of these stocks is going to be dead first? And it was Bed Bath & Beyond or GameStop. <laughs> and it was there was a strong vote for both. So to go from that and then like a month or two later to have this happen, it was, it was, I think, the definition of madness. So it was all sorts of fun. Dan, that's my vote. Maybe a bit of a cheat, but a good one nonetheless. But what is your vote to get us out of here for the year of 2021, sir? Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot of this crazy stuff, man. Um, I mean, there was this one time, maybe about two months ago, in QS, as I recall, which was not a super liquid name, but there were these far out of the money calls. And and like I traded it and and like like it really took off, made like 100 percent on on a large part of my position in like an hour or something. And so I started looking at other calls to the upside and I was like, huh, so this strike is offered at whatever it was, 10 cents. And then I can sell the I, I can sell its bid on the higher strike at 10 cents. Wait a minute. That means. I can leg a debit spread for free or just just got to pay commissions. Um, and if somebody was trading in Robinhood, they could do with no commissions. So um, like that, w- that was a crazy thing. I'm like, wait a minute. So you're saying that basically I can have this debit spread for free. All I have to do is leg it. OK, yeah, done. I'm in. Uh, you know, it's just crazy. Something that you should not ever find. But there it was. Ah, yes, there are many examples of quality trades, usually to what Dan was alluding to, kind of upside verticals and flies and ratios where the upside calls, you just got so bid, you could do those kinds of things. You could do verticals for free or maybe even a credit if you do a ratio or flies or things like that. So, yeah, there are many examples of that as well out there. We could spend many days listing all of those. But instead, we have to roll on out of here. So glad so many of you could join us through this mad year. (laughs) That was 2021 here on Options Bootcamp. Don't worry, we'll be back again in 2022. And Mr. Dan, if folks want to reach out to you over the course of these holidays or perhaps into early next year and talk about rating or meme stocks or any of these other madness, where should they go? What should they do? Make your way on over to markettaker.com, my friends. And um, I'd love to hear from you. I hear from listeners of the show all the time and you know i'd love to hear from you as well and maybe if they want some good holiday reading list off the books again for them really quick oh yeah well my books trading option greeks uh and and the market takers edge those are uh those are two they make great stocking stuffers uh might be a little late for that i guess we're gonna be after christmas when this episode comes out but um yeah well those are my books i'm waiting for the audio books that's what i'm waiting for uh, yeah. <laughs> I got to talk to my publisher. I guess that. in the meantime, they have this podcast. This is your audio book, sir, right here. You're welcome. You're welcome, listeners. I brought Dan <laughs> to the audio format 
for you. Of course, if you want to spell his name to go find it on the old Amazons, it's two S's, P-A-S-S-A-R-E, and then two L's, L-L-I. Look for Trading Options Greeks and all the other weighty tomes. Hope you guys had a great year listening to the show. We'll be back again for more options, madness, and education in 2022. We'll see you then. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.